Let me invite you to turn into that copy of your scriptures with me this morning as we think about the second topic on the Advent season, which is love. Thank you for the uh, music and leading us this morning and thinking about all of these uh, great ways to worship our God. The title of the message is God's Love and Our Love, and I put an outline on the back of your bulletin if you'd like to take notes. I'm sure you won't have room for all the notes you'd like to take, but at least it's an outline to follow, and you'll kind of know where we're going as we get started this morning in our thinking about the love of God. I'd like for you to turn to uh, 1 John chapter 4, and we're going to read our passage of Scripture. I'm going to read in just a moment chapter 4, verses 7 through the end of the chapter. But let me, before we do that, just give a brief introduction. I thought about uh, when Todd asked me to preach this morning on the topic of love, there were a lot of things that came through my mind, not the least of which is, why me? <laughs> but there were three particular challenges that I think you could identify with as we think about um, God's love and our love. The first one is the enormity of the topic, which we're going to dive into this morning and try to unwrap in whatever feeble way we can, but by focusing on the scriptures and what it says about God's love and how we should love. So it's, it's just a huge uh, theme. The second reason that it was a challenge as I thought about it is because of all the confusion and misunderstanding that we have in our world and our culture and have uh, for all the centuries past about what love really is. Think about the kinds of songs that were written, um, poems that have been written, uh, books about love, movies, things like that. And you realize it's not just a matter of being shallow. It's sometimes it's a, a huge misunderstanding of what love really is. And then sometimes it's even more than that. It's a, it's a twisting. It's a perverting. Um, but at the, very, at the very least, it's a shallow and a misunderstanding of what real love really is and what love really should be. It can be worldly, it can be superficial. But the third challenge is just the challenge of language. And when you think about, we, most of us speak English and understand English, but whatever language you speak or can speak, whatever language has ever been spoken in the world would have a hard time expressing the depth and enormity of this subject. Uh, even the Greek language which God chose to give us in the scriptures in the New Testament, uh, with all of the, the extra uh, ability that we have to communicate in that language, falls far short of understanding the nature of love, God's love for us, and our love to Him, and our love for one another. Those are the, the topics we're going to consider. And A.W. Tozer talked about this in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy. He said, I have about as much opportunity or chance of explaining to you or understanding the love of God as, it, as, as I would to reach up and grab a star. He said, but if there's a child that's reaching up to grab a star, at least it brings attention to the star and helps someone to see which direction they should look. And I thought that was an appropriate way to think about how we would address and um, look at our subject this morning. So if you have the scriptures in front of you, we're going to read 1 John chapter 4 and beginning in verse 7. And uh, I'm going to help you this morning memorize the verse that's in that passage and then uh, close by. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. Please follow along as I read to you right in the middle of this section where the apostle explains to us something about what it means to be a child of God, something about what it means to be born again. Because all through this letter, he has explained the truth of being a true child of God. He says a lot of people profess certain things. We have certain ways of confessing that we are someone. He says, but this is one of the evidences that you are truly regenerated, truly born again. And so here we come in chapter 4 to his explanation of how this works, both in terms of God's love and our love. So I'm going to begin reading in chapter 4, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. Why? For God is love. In this the love of God was manifested toward us, that God sent, has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us 
and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. Remember who is speaking here. Remember how he introduced this letter as one of the apostles, one of the original disciples. Verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Verse 19. We love him. Or some translations say, we love, because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Let's bow in prayer and ask the Lord to guide us as we think about this topic and look into his word. Lord, we do come before you this morning humbly and yet expectantly as we open the inspired scriptures and listen to you. And so we pray that you would give us an understanding that somehow today you might speak to us anew or maybe afresh to give us insight into this attribute, this character, quality of you and this characteristic of our lives that is true and should be true of us. We pray that you would not only give us understanding, but that you would give us the grace and strength to apply it to our lives. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your love for us today. And thank you for giving us understanding and what it means and what it means to us. And we ask for your guidance as we open the scriptures now. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look at the back of your bulletin, the verse that I'd like for you to think about with me is our theme verse this morning. Some of us is a little bit older, it's hard to remember things and it's hard to memorize scriptures, but we'll work on it together as we go through our message today. And so I printed it on there because it's from the New King James Version and it's slightly different because brothers and brethren and things like that. But it's 1 John 3.16. And 1 John 3.16 says, let's say it together. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Let's do that again. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So we begin thinking through this passage and the ones connected to it. I'd like for you to think about the three sixteens. Most of us know John 3.16. We memorize John 3.16. And maybe we forget who it was that was speaking in that passage. Jesus was in his conversation with Nicodemus when he spoke about himself in John 3.16 and, so, and told Nicodemus, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Apostle John knew that and wrote that for us. And then John later in his life, the Apostle of Love, wrote this letter as he talked about the love and the grace and the holiness and everything else that he saw in the Lord Jesus and the message that Christ had for us and for believers. And so in 1 John 3.16, we have an explanation, a reiteration, a restatement of this love. And I think it's helpful to us as we think about how great this subject is, how beautiful, how magnificent, how even indescribable, that we can have a statement like this that's true. By this, we know love. By this, we know love. 
So the first point that I'd like for us to make this morning in our message, as you see on your outline, is the God of love. And at first glance, you might think, well, what's the difference? God is love, the God of love, God loves. But it's very important that we begin with this uh, foundation. And the reason for that is because many times we say God is love, and we, we move real quickly into our relationship with God. We move real quickly and naturally, because we're human, into thinking about what God's love means for me what God's love means for mankind. But I don't think we really understand or appreciate the depth of God's love for us until we to begin to think about the fact, as John has said here, that God is love. And so, before we think about the love of God, I'd like for us to think about the God of love. And this is helpful to think about because of the statement that we've, we have in our text that God is love. But the problem that we have so often is our theology is, in almost every area of theology, is man-centered. What it means to me, how I apply this to me, um, God loves me, and th those things are true. But God's love is eternal. And that means a lot. It doesn't mean just that it's always been. It doesn't mean that it's unchangeable. It means that God, the triune God, we call it Trinity, right? has always loved. That's part of his nature. And I could kind of go off the subject a little bit and ask the question, what would it be like if this God that we love, this God that we know, this God that we serve, wasn't always that way or isn't love as one of his essential qualities or characteristics? We call them attributes because we attribute this, this truth, this understanding to the Lord. What if he was whimsical or, or hard to, uh, to have one particular approach to us? What if he was capricious? What if he changed? What if he was loving one day and burst out in anger and sometimes like we do another day? But God is not like that. And we should be humble and appreciate the, the truth of the fact that God is perfect love. Yeah, it's difficult for us to think about the eternity to start with. We start, we start back and we're so bound by time and controlled by time and everything. When we kind of get back to where before time began, that God never had a beginning, then our brains start to hurt. But just think about the fact that God has always, always existed. And then he's always been loved. The scripture talks about what we would call an intra or inter, I don't know if the right, the right term, an intra Trinitarian love. And we see that in John 5, we see it in John 17, other places. We won't have the time to talk about that. But Jesus said, As the Father has always loved me, There's, there had always been love within the Trinity. But now, with the, the creation of the world, which is an act of love on God's part, and the love he expresses to mankind, as we see in our memory verse, we see the love manifested. But just think about the fact that God, in his very essence, is love. That's where we begin, that God is love. I want to make sure we understand what the statement doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that love is God. It's not like love equals God, God equals love. We don't turn the statement around. People have misunderstood that. And sometimes the misunderstanding has been, well, uh, love is the essential quality of God or characteristic of God. So everything else is, is like related to that in some way. But it's, John's not saying that. He's just saying, yes, it's of God's essence. God is essentially love. God is love. But he's also holy. In fact, in the first chapter of this book, John said, God is light. So we, it's another way to talk about God's essential character. And God's love relates to his light. And they're not disconnected. There's no dichotomy. It's not like God's love over here at one time and over here now he's acting in an angry kind of way. It just gives us something... Um, to understand about the very essence of God as, as preeminently this way. But this is again where, where language fails us, any language. Octavius Winslow, who I quoted uh, for you in the, at the end of your outline today, was a, uh, a Puritan pastor from the 19th century. He, uh, was, he was an Englishman who ended up ministering here in the uh, United States. And one of the things he said in a book uh, that's titled Our God is this. Love is so completely the essence of God that it shines out in every perfection of his nature and is exhibited in every action of his administration. He is not only loving, he is love. His love must share the infinity of his being. 
And then he says this, it's a serious defect. Think about that. It's a serious defect in the religion of many that their faith deals too faintly with the infinity of God. So one of the, the reasons to preach the word and one of the reasons to emphasize this topic today is so that our faith would be strengthened. So we think more correctly about who God is. And it humbles us. Sure, we become more grateful for God's love as it's expressed to us, but it also humbles us to think about this God of love. So, when we think about the love of God and the holiness of God and all the other attributes of God, one of the things that I thought about was how Moses, uh, on the backside of the mountain, 40 years was there after being out of Egypt. And one day he had, had an encounter with God. And that bush was burning. But the bush didn't burn up because the fire was not a normal kind of fire. And it wasn't fueled by the bush itself. It was God. And it says that the Lord spoke to him out of the bush. And one of the things he said to him was, Moses, take off your sandals. Because the place you're standing is, is on holy ground. And I think that's where we are when we think about, we think about the love of God. So once we have just paused to praise God and worship Him for who He is in and of Himself, we're, we're ready to, to consider the fact that He loves us. And so go back to your text in 1 John. And we're learning 1 John 3.16 today, which says, By this we know love. Work with me on this now. By this we know love. Everyone together. That He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But John began that chapter in verse 1. So look back at 1 John chapter 3 in verse 1. Reading from the New King James Version, it says this. Behold, gets our attention, right? It's a pretty normal Greek word. Just see, look at this. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. That means, stop and think about that. That we should be called the children of God. And that's what John has been saying in this letter. It's one of the things he's been saying. If you call yourself a child of God, this is how you live. If you profess to be a follower of Christ, then you walk as He walked. If you profess to be a, a true disciple of Christ, that you belong to Him, then you confess sin. Then you walk in the light as He is in the light. Then you love your brother as God loves you and as God loves us. So, He says, What manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And I know that you know that I can't get through a message or escape the temptation to say something about the original text here. And so this is a good place to do it. There's a really interesting expression that you hadn't thought about probably in this, in this verse when it says, Behold what manner of love. What kind of love is this? This is connected to the as of John 3.16, right? This is connected to the as of the other verses, um, or the so, excuse me. God so loved us. This is what manner. It's an interesting Greek word that's not used very many times. I won't try to pronounce it. But it's used of the Lord after He calmed the sea. And the disciples, after going through that thing and thinking they were going to drown, they were done, it was over with, and Jesus said, stop. And so the sea became calm. And they looked at Jesus and said something like, whoa, what kind of person is this? It was spoken about the demoniac in the New Testament. Um, it talks about what kind of situation this guy, this was. It was spoken about um, Mary, the Virgin Mary, when Gabriel came and spoke to her. And, and the pastor says something to the effect of, uh, like, of what country was this? Or this is an astonishment. It's really just a term of, this is really different. This is astonishing. So what manner of love? We should, be, we should be struck. We should be pausing. We should be given great attention to this kind of love. And now we are His children. So we think about who we were, where we were as enemies of God, as 
as unbelievers, as non-children. We didn't belong to him. We think about that over against the nature of God's holiness, his wrath, his perfections, and how far he reached and how he reached down to us that we should be called the children of God. And so with that in mind, let's move over to verse 7. And let's consider for just a few minutes uh, of chapter 4, our principal passage for today. And I'd like to read that for you again and just think about some of the things that we learn um, in highlighting the description of God's love and our response to it in chapter 4, verse 7. So there we are. Please follow along carefully as we look at the text. 1 John 4, 7. So he uses the word beloved. We are children of God, right? Those of us that have chosen to follow Christ, confessed our sins, we are children, we are beloved. Beloved, he says to them, he commands them, let us love one another, for love is of God. John likes to use the expression of God, of the truth. It talks about your true nature, it's your origin. And this is a the vital connection. Love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. We'll come back to that. But that is something to underline in your scriptures or underline in your thinking today. Because he says, if you are really a loving person, then it shows that you are born of God and that you truly know God. And by loving, we'll examine and describe what we mean by that. He who does not love God does not know God, for God is love. John speaks in black and white. There's no, there's no middle ground with John. It's either here or there. It's either this side or, this, or the other side. It's black and white. And he says, if you don't love, you don't know God. Because God is love. So how, how can we say that we are true children of God, that we have his nature, John goes on to describe to us and explain to us, if... God is love, and we aren't love. That doesn't make sense. And that's what he says to us in, in chapter 5. And this, the love of God, was manifested toward us. It was demonstrated. It was explained. He uses that similar kinds of expression uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In this, it was explained. It was manifested toward us that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. There's so much in that verse we could talk about. But the result is that we can live. We're going to celebrate the Lord's table today and the fact that we have what we call salvation. We have what we call redemption. It's a, it's a reconciliation between th those who were enemies because we were an enemy of God and we've been reconciled now and we can live through Him. God sent His only begotten Son into the world. And this is how we will conclude our message thinking about this gift of the Son of God, as was already prayed this morning. Verse 10, and this is love. John wants to make sure we got this. He just continues with the same theme, and it's very helpful to us in our thinking. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us. This is the priority. God took the initiative. It's not like we thought of it, or we figured it out, or we did it without Him. God showed us His love, and He shows us how to love. And this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Before we talk about propitiation, we talk about Romans 5.8. Because Romans 5.8 talks about that. While we were yet, we were enemies, right? Uh, we were apart from God. God reached down. Romans 5.8 is a good connecting verse for that. While we were um, without God in the world, He loved us and sent His Son to be. The propitiation just means, well, it doesn't just mean anything because it's a big word. It's a deep word. But essentially means satisfaction. It is, it's a satisfactory substitute. He took our place and He satisfied the rightful wrath of God against sin. So, he was, the word is used in, the Hebrew, in Hebrews, for the mercy seat. He was the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins. So we don't get tripped up on a, on a long theological P word. It's only used four or five times in the scripture. That's what it means. And so then he says, verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. You see the connection between our memory verse and verse 11 of chapter 4. If God so loved us, if He loved us in this way, in this manner, we also ought to love 
one another. So, to sum up the, the truths of, uh, that we see here in this passage, i just like to develop them a little further as you look in your outline and think about how God's love is described for us. We think about the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ and what we call the season of Christmas, and we celebrate His birth and, and all of that means, the incarnation and then His life and His death and His resurrection. Jesus Christ, as He says, He sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. God's love for us is described here in this passage, but it's also described throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. And so I'd like for us to pick just a few of those uh, thoughts to consider what his love looks like. And so the first uh, sub-point here on the love of God is that God's love is described. Yes, we are so thankful that even though we know that the God of love, that God did demonstrate it for us. He lived it in this world, the world that we live in. He manifested his love for us, and it's described for us in a lot of ways. You can underline Psalm 103. There are four, at least four that I counted, verses in that chapter that talk about the Hebrew word kesed, which is the loyal, faithful love of God. And we can talk about the love of God in a lot of ways. As a matter of fact... I decided to pull off a volume on my bookshelf this week uh, by Stephen Charnock, who was a Puritan writer, and he wrote these large volumes on the attributes of God. And I have it all condensed into two volumes, which means it's in really small print, and I need my glasses to read it. But he goes into great depth and flowering language and incorporating all the scriptures and the thoughts of scriptures and the application to our lives of all these attributes, and he doesn't mention the love of God. Because the title for his chapter is The Goodness of God. And the goodness of God is expressed in his love. We talk about his grace, right? His mercy. He pities us as a father, his children. So there are a lot of words that we use. His goodness, his loving kindness is the word that's translated from that Hebrew word kesed in the Psalm 103 passage. So I've just written down a few uh, that I want to share with you of how God's love is described for us in the scriptures. And this is just a, a, um, a, a choosing of just a few very um, select passages of scripture and, and ideas and verses. And um, so I'll just share these with you as we think about uh, the love of God as we see it unfolding for us throughout the scriptures in a lot of different ways. So I'll just read these off real fast and you can just think about it because you won't have time to write them all down or get the references. But think about it this way. God's love for us is everlasting. This is given to us all the way through the scripture and I referenced it already in Jeremiah 31 where the prophet tells us about God's love for Israel. He said, I've loved you with an everlasting love. It says something about the choice of God for his people from eternity past. But his love is everlasting. It means it's unchanging for one thing. It has to be perfect because God is perfect, but His love is everlasting. John 17, 24 is another place where it talks about this love between the Father and the Son. And I think we'll get back to that verse a little bit later this morning. But it's also immeasurable. Psalm 103 says it's like up to the, to the sky and to the clouds. And you really can't measure that because it's just so big. I mean, we thought we could measure it many, many years ago. But then the more we got into our telescopes and all of that, we realized this is not measurable. I mean, only a hundred years ago, we thought we could number the stars. A couple hundred years ago, we thought we could number, number the stars. And now we realize we can't even number the galaxies that are out there. So when you think about how high the heavens are above the earth, whatever the heavens mean there, God's love is there. That's described for us. It's, un it's unconquerable. Romans 8 says, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's also inseparable. He says in, in Romans chapter 8, after telling us how he's chosen us and, and predestined us that we would become like his children, that all things work together for good to those that love God and are called to, according to his purpose, he says nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Then he asked these questions. Who could do that? How could that happen? What could do this? He said, no, you can't be separated from the love of God. It's Trinitarian. That's John 17, 24. Just one of the verses that I picked. I mentioned also John 5. It's perfect, John 13, 1. It says when he's with the disciples at the Last Supper, just at the time when he's going to take the, the towel and wash the disciples' feet because no one else would do it, it's at the time when the disciples were trying to decide who would be the greatest in the kingdom and they were arguing about uh, who would take over and who would be up at the top and all that. Jesus gets up and washes their feet. 
But John 13, 1 says, having loved his disciples who were in the world, he loved them to the teleos, to the end, to the greatest degree possible. It's a perfection of God's love if it's not some sort of a description of the greatness of his love. It's undeserved, Hebrews, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4. It's forgiving, Ephesians chapter 1. It's redeeming. Psalm 103 says, He has redeemed us from destruction and crowned us with loving kindness and tender mercies. God's love is poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans chapter 5. Ephesians 4 also says it's great. That's why we have a problem with language. Great means a lot of things, but how do we describe the love of God that's infinite and imperfect? Paul says it's great. It's electing and adopting, Ephesians chapter 1. It's life-giving, Ephesians 2. It says that he's given us life. It's self-sacrificing, Romans 5, 8, we've quoted. God's love takes the initiative. We see that in Romans 5, 8. It's the basis for our love. We saw that in 1 John 5 and verse 19. And it surpasses knowledge. So no matter what we say, no matter how flowery our language, no matter how much we understand, we never really get our arms around all it means in our thinking about the love of God. That's how God's love is described. But God's love is manifested. And that's the second point, the sub-point that we see as we've looked at our passage already. God's love is manifested for this. And it's clear to us that it's important that by this we know. This is how it was revealed. And I've added three references for you. We quoted John 3.16. We've mentioned John 13.1. I'd like for you to look over to the Gospel of John at John chapter 17. I feel like it's important for you to see this passage as we think about the love that we experience today, the love that, we've, that we're describing, the love that was evident at the manger, the love that we see on the cross. In John chapter 17, I believe that this prayer, the high priestly prayer of Christ, was given in the company and audience of his disciples. I don't think there's a break from 13 to 17 where Jesus is off on his own. I think the disciples heard him pray. There doesn't seem to be any kind of disconnect. But if you look at the end of this prayer, we've mentioned 17. Uh, so let me just read to you 17, 24, and 25. What is he praying? John 17, 24 says, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you, and these have known that you sent me. And I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be in them, and I in them. God's love was manifested in Christ. It was described in his prayer. And he interceded with the Father that we would know that love that was so clearly manifested in his life, in his death. And in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we see it in the scriptures, love like God has, has to be shown. It has to come out. It has to be manifested. It has to be exhibited. And we believe that one of the reasons, if not the primary reason, that God created the universe and us, even us today, is so that he could not just be glorified, but so that he could love us. So that one of these things that we call the attributes of God could be put on display. So that little word, word so is, is summed up in all that we just said about God's description and manifestation of the love. He loved us to this extent. So what did he do? He sent his only begotten son into the world that we could live through him. Well, how do we respond? We're convicted by thinking about the love of God. We're, we're encouraged and our hearts are lifted and our minds are expanded. And we think about God is love. God loves us. This is how he's given his love to us and shown his love to us. But John's saying 
it's not just a matter of redemption. It's not just a matter of you understanding theology. This is how you live. This is how we should respond. So how do we respond? What are the expression of the love of God's children? This is point number three on your outline. And we have two expressions. I would say these are two directions. But it's the same love. It's agape. John uses, I think, like 40 times in this one letter, this word agape. But the love that we have in response is just given in two directions. Same love toward God, toward others. And those are not disconnected, as we're going to see. So the love of God's children. Our passage today tells us that the love of God is, is poured out. And that we prove that we are His children because we respond in love. So let's see how we respond. One of the fundamental ways that we love God, as you're going to see, is by keeping His commandments. But I want you to think about the question that was asked by a lawyer one time when they tried to question Jesus and trick Him from time to time. You see it in Matthew chapter 22, if you remember. There was a time when uh, a lawyer came to Him and said something to the effect of, what's the greatest commandment? Now, that could have been a tricky question, right? Because of the kind of um, arguments that were going on, and they would trip Jesus up, because if he would say this, then they would say, well, that can't be right, or, you know, we know that you're just with Moses, or you're not with Moses, because you didn't quote that one. And uh, Jesus, in, in his perfect, of course, way, didn't quote any of the Ten Commandments, did he? What did he say? He said, here's the, here's the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, Two different, two different ways of saying it, because different texts, but in the Gospels. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. That's the greatest commandment. Everything you have, it's all of you. It's all that you can possibly think. It's all the energy you have. It's all of your soul. This is, this is the greatest commandment. This is what you should do. God commands you to love Him, and the Ten Commandments explain what that looks like, in part. But then he says, and the second is like unto it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. So the love of God's children has these two dimensions, these two expressions. There's one key word to think about and ask the question, how do we love God? That's your subpoint on your outline, loving God, John chapter 15, verses 9 and 10, and 1 John 3. In the sake of, for the sake of time, go back to 1 John and just turn over. All you have to do is look across your page from our text this morning, and you can see what, Jesus, what John said about the love of God and what it looks like. And so if you ask me the question, okay, that's really great. You say, love God with all you are. Love God with all your soul and all your strength. But, but how do I do that? I mean, practically speaking. And so he helps us. Verse 2, John, first John 5. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. So that's how it's connected. That's one way it's connected. We love God by loving His children. But then he says, for this is the love of God that we do what? That we talk about it, that we say nice prayers, that we do good things. No, this is the love of God. Not that we just have affection for God or we... No, this is the love of God that you keep His commandments. And that's what He said in John 15. And that's why I've referenced, referenced since here. Because when Jesus talked to His disciples, he, he talked to them about them abiding in the vine and how when they did that, God would produce love in them. He would produce all kinds of fruit. But He said to them, you will prove to yourself to be my disciples when you keep my commandments. And so, loving God is all about obedience. So how do we respond to God's magnanimous love for us? We respond by loving Him in return. It's a love that, of course, He can only produce, that we can only have in our lives as He produces it, but we love by, by doing what He says, by taking Him seriously, by valuing His will, by keeping His commandments. And one of the specific ways we do that, as we move in through this message to the, to the application points today, is by loving others. Because we can say, well, I really love God. I keep this commandment and I do this thing that he says over here. But one of the most difficult as well as practical ways to show that we love God is by loving other people. John talks about loving our brethren. The scripture talks about loving our neighbor, as Jesus said, and about loving our enemies. Clearly, this is a 
a supernatural kind of love. This is a love that only God can produce in us. We can't do it in and of ourselves, but it can, it can happen because we are God's children. So what about loving others? We've seen it in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. We see it at the end of the chapter where he says that uh, we love because he first loved us. So let's think about that. By this we know love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Paul said in, in Romans chapter 8, uh, for scarcely for a righteous man would one die. Right? But God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now, there are a lot of ways to think about that. I, I expect, I fully believe that any of you as parents would give up your life for your child. I, I know that's true. Um, I'm also pretty convinced from my own experience and just thinking about human nature that none of you would give up your child for anyone else. But there, there are other ways to think about how... But this is what Jesus did. Intra-Trinitarian intra love. He sent His only Son to be the Savior, to be the propitiation for our sins. By this we know love. But what he's saying here, what the point we're making is that we love because he loved us. The Greek doesn't, some of the Greek texts don't have the word him. And whether you have him, we love him because he first loved us, or we just, we love because he first loved us, it says the same thing. Because we know that we love him and we know that we love others because God took the initiative. Because God showed us how to love. Because our lives are changed, we call it regeneration, because we are children of God and He produces His love in us and we have a new nature and so we love because He, he first loved us. It's really another way of saying like father, like son. We are like God most when we love others. We are like God most when we love our neighbor. We love God with all of our heart, our soul, and our strength when we love our neighbor as ourselves, even when we have love toward those that are unworthy, undeserving, or even our enemies. And so now you're thinking about 1 Corinthians 13. You're thinking about it because it's on your outline, but also it's come to your mind because you're thinking about the quality of love. And so the only thing I want to do is just reference that now. And just re reminds you that in 1 Corinthians 13, one of the things that the Apostle says in that great description about love is that love does not seek its own. Agape does not seek its own. God the Father did not seek His own. He, he asked us to not seek our own in our relationships with other people. So in this clear and most beautiful expression, we realize that, we remember that the love of God has to be produced in our lives by Him. So we read that description of God's love and it, it believes all things, it hopes all things. It uh, does not vaunt itself, it doesn't puff itself up. And many other expressions of the love of God. And if we ask ourselves, what does love really look like in human relationships? That's where we go, 1 Corinthians 13. So I just read that passage and said, wow. <laughs> One of the things that we want to say this morning as we think about Christmas and, and the Advent season and the word love is that not only do we have a problem in our, with our language, and not only do we have the deficiency of thinking uh, incorrectly about love, uh, the way our culture does, um, express in different songs. I, I went and looked up some songs, and, and I was like, I can't even believe that a lyric for a so-called Christian song about love would, would say nothing about biblical love or God's love. I'm not surprised that you'd have songs that are written for movies or secular artists that don't understand what true love is, that, that pervert it or, or minimize it or to totally miss the point. But I think we miss the point sometimes too as Christians, as believers. So think about it this way. Sometimes we want to explain to our children about Christmas and so what, we say, what do we say to them? Well, it's not about the gifts. 
you know, it's about Jesus or um, don't forget the golden rule or, hey, you know, it's better to give than to receive. But that kind of a bit shallow thinking is sometimes the way that we think about love. We don't think about it being self-giving and self-sacrificing and giving all of ourselves or, or the fact that God gave up His only begotten Son. They often, our thinking about love, our living the life of love often falls far short of what God requires and expects of us, what He desires to produce in us. Because Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, we should be imitators of God. So then I asked this question, how? In my outline, I put the word but in big letters. But, how could you, how would you live this kind of love? How would you respond to this kind of message? How would you do it in your own strength? Even if you were convinced, even if today you were just really motivated to be a loving person, would you just, well, we crank it up, we do it in our own strength, we just do it? Of course not. Only a regenerated person, John says, can love this way, but a regenerated person does love this way. And so we realize that if we are of God, if we know God, if we belong to God, if God lives in us, Ephesians 3 says, He produces that kind of love. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not just a matter of seeking to, to be loving and be altruistic, because the world can do that. We were not saying this morning that people that don't know Christ can't be loving or do nice things or be kind to people. We see that on a human level. And we do that too. But we're asked to be self-sacrificing, self-giving. And only the power of the Holy Spirit can produce, can produce that kind of love in us. So the answer to the question of how is by the grace of God. Sure, you can be kind and generous without God working in your life, but God commands us to love with all of our being, and that's not possible unless we come to the Lord and depend upon Him and ask Him to produce this life in us. But the point that John is making is, if you are truly a child of God, if you are of God, then love is a primary quality, a primary characteristic in your life. So God's children prove themselves to be of God, to belong to Him, to be regenerated, and one who professes to be of God becomes a loving person, an imitator of God. There's some other thoughts that, that I'd like for you to think about. We can insert into another time, another place. But one of the things that John says here is that no man has seen God. And as you read that passage with me a little while ago, it might have kind of distracted you. thought, well, what does that mean? Why does he put that there? Well, think about it this way. In John 13, when Jesus was getting ready to go, he said, I'm not going to be with you much longer. They're like, whoa, wait. And then John 14, he says, don't let your heart be troubled. God, I'm preparing a place for you. And then he says in 13 and 14, I'm sending the Holy Spirit. But what he said to them is similar to, I think, what we find in 1 John 4. No man has seen God at any time. So I ask the question, how does the world see God? And I answer that question, I think, the way John does here and the way the Lord does in John 13. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples when you have love for one another. No man has seen God at any time, but when they see a love in your life that can only be described in terms of God, God-like, godly, God-produced, then they know that you're different. And it brings glory to God, but enables God to be seen in some way, in some very clear way. They will know we are disciples because we have a self-sacrificing love. Just as God's love for us is so foreign, like of what kind of love is this? What manner of love does God have for us? So that kind of love is foreign to people in our culture. And we have the privilege, we have the responsibility of living, of demonstrating that love to those around us. So what have we seen this morning? Say it with me. By this we know love. That he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And Winslow said, The love of God will become a motivating power in our lives to the extent that we experience it in our souls. 
It goes on to say, as you see here, the outward holy life of a believer is the result of an inward principle of love to God. Our love to God is lived out in our love to Him and our love to others by obeying His commands and by loving people. And so I would suggest to you this morning as we celebrate the Advent season, let's thank Him for the love that He's expressed to us. And let's ask Him to produce this same kind of love in our lives and our relationships with those around us. Let's pray.